everybody came out this morning. Uh, good morning. <laughs> I think that's the right way to say it. But uh, it's a whatever. It's 15 above zero. Uh, we're all wearing masks. And uh, I don't know. If somebody had told me 15 years ago I would be going into a gun shop or a bank with a mask on, I would have looked at them and said, you are some kind of crazy. I would never do that. And of course, we've been doing that for the last year. Um, we really do need to pray that this, whatever it is, will go crazy and go by and get away from us. Uh, I don't know how else to get it to go away other than pray for it and ask God to take care of it. He has taken care of many other things, so let's, let's make sure that we do that. In your bulletin this morning, uh, several things in there. Uh, number one, the uh, Bible study uh, that we normally have on Wednesday night uh, is canceled for now. Uh, but we're going to take up the discussion of the Bible study at our business meeting next Saturday night. Saturday night will be our business meeting at 6 p.m. Yeah, we have, project this project is our project election project meeting. Project again, we fine. have to elect a clerk, treasurer, uh, two elders, and uh, one vacant trustee. It's the power. From now on, you know, at least for a while, we're going to wear masks over here in the church. In church. Except up here, Brother Jim and I, we can't wear masks. Um, well, you couldn't hear me. Sure. I don't know if there's a remote when you put here anything. So but, uh, we're just trying to work do a social distance while we're up here. And, uh, wear masks when we're not. Try to get along with it. Uh, remember our missionary, Sandy Timisbury. Remember our sick and shut in with a drawing crew. Stainless steel kettle back there is still our uh, collection basket. And uh, there's a whole boatload of uh, prairie crust over on the right hand side. We'll be able to deal with those in a few minutes. Uh, anybody else have anything you'd like to share with us this morning before we start our service? If not, Brother Bob, would you stand and ask God a blessing on our service? Thank you, Lord, for being with us throughout this pandemic. Continue walking with our sites and also be with those who are friends and loved ones. So many of them are nervous and need your special attention. Lord, be with them and be with us throughout this service. And we can learn more of your words for your praise. Please thank you, Pastor, for your support and name. Amen. Amen. Sister Lord, would you like to ask God's blessing upon our offering? Thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us and another day to serve you. Bless the offering and everyone who gives. And help us to use the money wisely and to keep the church doors open and have all the bills paid. In Jesus' name, amen.
page 151. Praise him, praise him. <clears throat>
Remember Brother Jim and Sister Sandy. Remember Sister Ollie and Aunt Dorothy. Remember Sister Dinah Williams. Remember Sister Julie and her health. Remember Brother Gary and his health. Remember Sister Rosie and her family. Brother Chuck's friend, Scott Hackenberg. Brandon and Amanda having marriage problems. Remember Brother Randy and Sister Barb. Remember Dave Swindler and his recovery. Remember Brother Larry and Sister Lee Faust. Remember Jenny Witt recovering from a car accident. Pray about our electric problem here at the church. Looks like the problems within the church. We need help finding it. Lori's uncle, Louie in Mansfield. He, he's in his last days unless God intervenes. Anybody else have a request? Brother Jim, Larry called, uh, and Sister Lee is really bad sick. I don't know if it's COVID or what. Uh, she was just having stomach problems. Um, so remember Sister Lee. Anybody else? A lot of you here know Jenny Wynn and the car accident. She's doing okay, but now she's got blood clots in both of her legs. And our daughter-in-law, Julie, is going down to OSU Thursday. She's got fluid around her lungs. They removed it twice. And they don't know. They're going in her side with a camera to take a biopsy, trying to figure out what's causing it. So we need your prayers. Anybody else? Yes, I'd like to also remember the Razzie family. Uh, their father was in a car accident and he messed up his knee pretty bad. He had surgery on his knee. He's not even at the point where he can get up on crutches yet. So uh, he can't go up and down the stairs or anything. Uh, I'd like to keep them in our prayers. The what was the name? The Razzie family. Razzie? got a, uh, I forgot to bring it, I meant to bring it in, we got a uh, postcard from the kids and the family thanking us. Uh, the church donated a $50 uh, Kroger gift card and some food boxes. And uh, also I took the kids geocaching and gave them some uh, all pouch with some geocache stuff in it. <coughs> Anybody else? If not, Sister Barb, you like to text the Lord for her and remember these requests? say good morning to everybody again. Uh, it's always kind of funny, you know. Uh, I know not everybody thinks the same way that I do, but when I'm over there and I say good morning, it's almost kind of like a business meeting thing. But when I get over here and say good morning, it's hi family, I yell them. Uh, fun thing. Uh, I enjoy being here in church. I enjoy being with my church family. Glad that you came out to be with us. We're few in number today, but at the same time, uh, we said this last week, um, several years ago, uh, we came to church one morning and we counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I looked and looked and looked. I was ready to look under the pew to see if there was somebody hiding down there. There never was. <laughs> we only had seven. So even though we've only got 10 this morning, we're still three above. We're 30% better than we were at our worst uh, attendance record here. And uh, you know, when you, when you stop and think about things like that, God has truly been good to us. Uh, he has kept us afloat here in this last year when you know we were shut down twice and uh, nobody came to church, you know. We still had the bills to pay. 
but God has blessed us uh, financially, blessed us spiritually. Uh, there's a dozen different ways I could say he blessed us, but the important thing is he did bless us, and that's that's what we really need. And you know, I, I know a lot of people say, well, you know, well, God doesn't seem to bless me. Well, maybe you don't ask the right way is the problem. Uh, there are people out there that are complaining that God seems to have forgotten them. God has never forgotten anybody. Uh, there, are some, there are some people that, well, they just don't get the blessings because they don't reach out to, to him first, which we, we've got to do. We have to reach out and say, Lord, I love you. And then he comes back and does what he needs to do. But it's, again, it's a good thing to be here in the house of the Lord this morning. Somebody have a special blessing you want to share with us or a song uh, just want to stand and wave your hands and say I love the Lord anybody at all um, I was reminded <coughs> of all the blessing God gave the church the week that we after we closed three weeks this last time uh, we found the envelope in the mailbox addressed to the church and there was $400 in it and there was no name on it it was all $20 bills. And God protected that money to get here through the mail. It was a lot of mail, you know, if it feels thick, someone might take it. But it made it here to the church, and we don't know who to thank for it. But it was all in $20 bills. There was 400 bucks. <laughs> so we put it in our account, you know, church. So... I thank whoever sent it. <clears throat> I uh, was driving that day. She reached out into the mailbox and she pulled out an envelope. And when she was bringing the envelope in, I could see there's something in that envelope. I just assumed it was probably a, you know, a thank you note or something like that. Uh, well, I opened it up and there was a whole lot of thank you notes in there. But uh, again, you know, it just goes to show that. Lord loves us and he's, he's taking care of us. Apparently we're doing what he wants us to do. <clears throat> Anybody else? Okay. Well, all hearts and minds are clear. We'll just, it's a little early, but we'll just go on with the message this morning. Well, last week, I spoke about Joshua's final message to the Israelites. Joshua had uh, lived his life he had taken over from Moses. Moses died being able to look over and see the promised land. But because of his disobedience, he did not get to walk into the promised land. Uh, God chose Joshua to be his successor. And, you know, if you get your Bible out, you read what Joshua did. Joshua did a good job. Uh, he succeeded in taking the nation of Israel across the Jordan River. Uh, up into Jericho, and from there on, north and west, they took the land of Israel. Now, they didn't take it all. There was still some left when he died that had not been conquered. But Joshua got them started in the correct direction. And again, his final message was a lot of different things, but those last few words were the important last few words. He said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I, I really do love, uh, every now and then I get to go to somebody's house, go visiting or something along those lines. And I really love when I walk in the house and I, I see that on a plaque, on a towel, or something along those lines. I know I'm in the right place. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Yes, I love that. But uh, that was uh, Joshua's final message. Today, I would like to take one of Jesus' final messages to his disciples uh, as the, I guess you'd want to say, subject of today's message. Uh, and, of course, that if you want to open your Bibles, uh, some of it is found in Matthew 24. We'll be going a couple of other places. And I wish I had my projector, but it decided it just doesn't want to play today. You can see the lights blinking. We're having the electrical problem. We thought we had part of it solved. Obviously, we don't. We've got to look again at another place to see if we can solve it. Um, 
It's obviously not a super serious problem or we would have serious electrical problems. It's just one of those aggravating problems. It's kind of like a, a toaster that only gets toast warm or burns it black. You know, you only, you only get one of those things that aggravates you to no end. Nothing's, it's not gonna burn the house down, it's not gonna kill anybody, it sure is aggravating. And that's where our electric is, it sure is aggravating. But good Lord willing, uh, he's always came through and uh, we're continuing to pray and look and see if we can find what's wrong with it. Uh, eventually, we will find the problem, I'm, I'm sure of that. You saw the lights just go dim, that's, that's part of the problem. That's what drops the projector off when the voltage goes down. But we'll find it one of these days. The message we wanted to deal with you, or to share with you today, deals with Jesus leaving the temple area. It was on the week that he was crucified. This is, the day is Tuesday. He has spent most of the day Tuesday in the temple area and in Jerusalem. They got ready to leave the temple area. And uh, this was the last really good day that he would have. The next day, of course, would be Wednesday. It would be a, a, a pretty fair day. Uh, on Wednesday, he had the Lord's Supper. Uh, he spoke several chapters in the book of John. A lot of real heavy-duty uh, Bible reading, heavy-duty understanding uh, in the uh, book of John there. But uh, here, we're in uh, Matthew 24. Uh, they have left the temple area, and the first slide that we would have had up there uh, is recorded not only in Matthew, but also in Mark and Luke. A lot of this particular discussion, Matthew has it here, Mark has it about here, and then Luke has it about there. Uh, it all covers pretty much the same message. A few little things one will put in more important than another, but all three of the writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, pretty much covered the whole thing. In Matthew 24, 2, it would have been the first slide, it says, And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Our precious and most kind Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We Thank you, Father, for all of your many blessings. Most importantly, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and for what he means to us. Father God, in these days, I guess is the best way to say it, we may be in the end times. We do not know. We do know that there are several things that have occurred, have happened, that makes it look like we're very, very close. But there are also several things that need to happen uh, that have to be seen before the end of time can actually come. Now we realize we're not going, we as individuals are not going to be able to see each and every one. But there are many markers out there and we thank you Father that you gave us those markers. Help us to see the ones that are important for us to see. Help us to understand what is important for us to understand. We'll give you the praise for it all in Jesus' wondrous name. And they all said, Amen. Amen. In reality today, the temple area uh, is uh, in serious debate. Uh, we talked about Jesus and the disciples leaving the temple. When they left the temple, they came out the eastern uh, door, so to speak, of the temple would have gone across out the eastern gate of the eastern wall of Jerusalem, down over the hill, across the brook Kidron, or the little stream that runs there, and then up the side of the hill there to the Mount of Olives. And that's where Jesus had this discussion with his disciples. The uh, discussion uh, at that particular point in time was not necessarily about the temple area, but it was about the temple itself when Jesus said the day is coming that there will not be one stone left upon another which brings up the debate on the area of where the temple is was or could have been or maybe wasn't uh, a number of years ago in fact uh, a couple centuries ago the 
thought pattern was that the temple was up on what is known today as Temple Rock or Temple Plateau, or Temple Area. Up in that area today, the Muslims have a place called the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock is considered the third most holy place for Muslims. And there is also a, uh, it's not a synagogue, and it's not a church, it's a Muslim worship place. Uh, it's also on that same area. But the funny thing about that, and we're not going to really go a long way on this, but the funny thing about the Dome of the Rock being up on Temple Mount, Temple Mount itself is a, almost a square, and within 30 feet or so each direction, it fits the exact dimensions of the Roman forts that were being built at that time. It also happens to fit the place where a Roman fort would have been, up on top of the hill. It also happens to be big enough to have housed the 10,000 people that would have been there in Jerusalem as Roman soldiers, cooks, bakers, wives, brothers, children, and so forth. There is no other place in all of Jerusalem where they could have housed the 10,000 people. <clears throat> this debate that's going on about the temple area says that down over the hill towards the, would be the south, in the city of David, which is what the Bible says is where the temple was, in the city of David is where a lot of people truly believe the temple originally was. And if you go down there, you will find exactly what Jesus said. Not one stone left on another. In fact, <clears throat> many people believe, and there's been some, and I don't know how they determined this, I suppose soil samples or something. They determined that some of the rocks that are up on the temple area came out of the city of David. Again, it's one of those things that we're not going to really go too far with uh, as far as uh, today's discussion. Uh, it's one of those discussions I would love to have a Bible study, Brother Bob, uh, talking about the temple and showing the... Uh, we do not have an exact perfect picture or exact perfect diagram of the temple area, simply because the Israelites at that particular point in time would not allow a drawing to be made. If I wanted to remember Jim, for example, as an Israelite, if I wanted to remember Jim, it was a sin, and it was a, a, a bad sin, for me to have a Roman uh, artist, would be the right word, to draw me a picture of Jim that I could set it up on the wall. That was against the law. It was a terrible sin to have the likeness of something that actually belonged here on this earth. You could not have that likeness. Because the idea was they were afraid you would have the likeness on the wall and then you would begin to worship the likeness. I don't think there's one of us here that worships our grandfather, <coughs> our grandmothers, our parents, our daughters, our sons, our family and our friends or our houses or anything. But we've got pictures up on the wall. There is nobody that goes back there to that picture back there by Mary. Uh, that likeness of Jesus holding that person. There's nobody that goes back there and oh, bows down to it and worships it. We look at it and we say, that's really neat. That's all the farther we do. The Israelites could not have had anything like that in their house, in a worship place, even on a wall outside the, the uh, houses uh, along the uh, streets. You couldn't have had that out there. In the same way, there's no, there's no likeness of the temple other than some old, beat-up Roman drawings. And, you know, the Romans were great for, uh, what do you want to call it, art. They, they loved art. Uh, they loved statues. They loved all of this carving stuff in walls and so forth. They, they loved to do that. So there were some rough sketches, and that's all we have as far as what the real temple actually looked like. But uh, that temple was totally destroyed. Uh, not one stone left on another. Uh, the stones, again, uh, were very probably uh, 
picked up, taken up on top of Temple Mount. And what would really be ironic would be that some of the stones that used to be in Herod's temple were used to build the Dome of the Rock. <laughs> that would be ironic. I, as I, that thought came to me the other day that the true temple of Israel, uh, the stones that made the temple of Israel, the stones that heard the voice of Jesus, the stones that heard the voices of the disciples, the stones that heard his preaching, are actually, possibly, and in fact, probably incorporated in the Dome of the Rock and the uh, Muslim worship place up there. Uh, it's kind of ironic, but you know what the funny part about that? God is like that. He'll do things like that every time. Uh, it's like the battle when Joshua uh, commanded uh, the sun to stand still. Out of the sky, what came? In the middle of the summertime, what came out of the sky? Blocks of ice. What did the blocks of ice do? They just happened to land in front of the Israeli army and just happened to land on top of the Palestinians or the, those people that were fighting against Israel. It just happened to be that way. Dead in the middle of summertime, icicles came out of the sky. Thank you, God. You do have a sense of humor. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But uh, they went across across the Brook Kidron, went up into the Mount of Olives, and uh, one of the disciples asked another question, and we find that in Luke chapter 21, verse 7. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? That's the first question. And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And that's where we begin Matthew 24. He starts talking in Matthew 24. One of the first things that Jesus said is, be not deceived. Many shall come in my name. Uh, they shall fool uh, anybody that they can. The important thing is to remember, oh, is though that these people who come saying that they are Jesus or imitating that they are Jesus, they're deceivers. They're 100% absolutely dead, died in the wool. Deceivers. Jesus is not coming back in the flesh like I am like you are. He's coming back a whole different way. It's a spiritual body that he will come back with. He will come back out of the eastern sky and he will not come back alone. He is bringing back all of our dead loved ones, all of those that have, that have died between Adam himself and the day that he comes back. All of the righteous dead. I guess that would be the right way to say all the righteous dead are coming back with him. It's not going to be him. There was a fellow, I'm going to say 1968, 1969, 1970, somewhere in that neighborhood, rented one of the football stadiums in Texas to proclaim the day of the Lord, that he was Jesus, and we were going, they were going to rapture out that day. Something around 5,000 people paid whatever the entrance fee was to get in there, sat down, listened to him talk, and one by one got bored, got up, and left. The only thing that happened that day was a thief, a liar, and an imposter made a ton of money. That's the only thing that happened that day. There was no great preaching. There was no great teaching. And, well, there was no rapture. Or some of us would, would never have been here. Uh, that was the first thing that Jesus said. That uh, there would be people come doing everything they could to deceive anyone and everyone who could be deceived. That's the important thing. Understand there are very specific things stated about the return of Jesus one of those very specific things I've already touched on, he will come out of the eastern sky, out the western sky, the southern sky, the northern sky, or the sky straight up. He's coming out of the eastern sky. We're going to see him coming from the east. And the scripture says, as the lightning shineth from the east unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. How fast does lightning come from the east to the west? 
186,000 miles per second. In one eighth of a second. Now, I'm not sure that that is one eighth of a second, but that's pretty close to it. In one eighth of a second, Jesus Christ and his army from heaven will circle the world. The dead in Christ will rise first. And if we are alive and remain on that day, it's going to be funny. And the reason it's going to be funny is there's going to be this little old man, this little old Christian on a pair of crutches. And he's maybe going to be going into Walmart or Kroger's or maybe just walking down the street. Jesus Christ is going to split the eastern sky, Brother Jim. And them crutches ain't going to be needed no more. That old crippled foot of his that he had to try to turn to get out in front of him, he's going to turn around straight, he's going to stand up, <laughs> and then he's going to go up, praise the Lord. People laying today on their deathbed in nursing homes and in hospitals and intensive care units that are born again, bought by the blood of Jesus, and on their way to heaven, when the Lord comes back, it splits, splits that eastern sky. They ain't going to set up in bed. They're going to jump up. They're going to stand up. And then they're going to go up. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. I would love to talk about this part of the scriptures and this part of the Bible. And by the way, just in case you're interested about prophecy, there's, uh, what is it? Uh, I forget. I used to know the number of words that are in the Bible. Rough number. Whatever it is. 26 to 28 percent of all of the text that's in God's Word deals with prophecy. So if you're interested in what's going to happen ahead of time, somewhere in the future, about one out of four words has something to do with it, Brother Jim. But uh, the first thing that he said is be not deceived. The second thing that he said is there would be wars and rumors of wars. What causes wars? People. How do you stop wars? Get rid of people. I mean, it's just as simple as that. Uh, we, we go all the way back to Adam and Eve. There was Cain and Abel. What happened with Cain and Abel? War. It's been going on ever since. It is not going to stop until... That eastern sky is busted open, the dead in Christ rise first, and those of us who are alive and remain are changed. You got people, you're going to have a war. The third thing that Jesus touched on there in Matthew 24 is that Christians shall be persecuted. Let me say that again. Christians shall be persecuted. <laughs> I'm not going to stand here and say, this has already started. But I'm going to say, I think it started. We've had more persecution of Christians in the last 15 years than I ever remember in the other 60 years of my life. Hundreds of Christians in Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Iran for sure, Iraq, have been literally beheaded by the Muslims. They make videos of it, and they use the videos, they promote the videos on Muslim television and Muslim websites to show what happens if you give your life to Christ. If you become a Christian, we will kill you. That's the message that they say, and they do it. They have gone into Africa. There are several countries in Africa that are slowly but surely becoming Muslim simply because the Muslims are killing off the Christians. And you say, but well, Brother Dwight, uh, that's over there. That's not here. No, that's not here. But I'll tell you what is here. There's a bald-headed uh, governor in a state called California who stood up one day and said, close the churches. And because he was governor of the state of California, churches had to close. They could not have the service we're having today. They were not allowed to open up for any reason whatsoever with more than, I think, six people. 
And something, there was some reason for that. I think it was for cleaning the churches or something along those lines. I'm not sure exactly what it was. But there was a certain, and it was a small number, was allowed in the church. And they were only allowed in so many hours a day or whatever. You could not have service. So the, this one pastor, bless his heart, <laughs> I had to laugh. He said, okay, we can't have church in the church. We can have church in the parking lot. So they went out in the parking lot. <laughs> and apparently they didn't have pews, they had chairs. So they took the chairs out, and some of the guys there, they took a tape measure, and they moved it across six feet from everybody. Everybody was six feet from everybody else. And uh, apparently the governor and whoever else got all incensed over this because they thought they were shutting the churches down, I guess. And here he was telling them, yeah, we're going to have church anyway. So he's out there preaching to have a church. They came in and tried to shut him down. And I think they were successful the first weekend. The next weekend they came in, uh, the governor had already uh, issued another edict. You cannot be singing because singing projects the vapors from your mouth and projects the sickness from your mouth if you're sick and more people will get it. You cannot sing. Well, the pastor said, maybe you can't, but I can, and you're not going to tell me what to do. So the pastor and one of his elders and a few of the others got out there and started singing, and the governor's Gestapo, I think that'd probably be a good word, Brother Jim. The governor's Gestapo was standing there watching them sing outside with masks on. The governor's Gestapo went over, arrested them, put handcuffs on them, put them in the back of a paddy wagon, took them downtown, and put them in jail. Now, they were bailed out fairly soon. It's just the idea that they did it. That's the, the part that is so bad. Not only did they do it, but they got away with it. Nobody, there were several people that stood up and said, what about the Constitution of the United States? Well, we're in a pandemic. The Constitution doesn't count. I got news for you, folks. There is no place in the Constitution of the United States that says, except for a pandemic. These rights that we have were not given by a piece of paper. These rights that we have were given by Almighty God, and the worship of God is one of them. And if I go to jail, y'all are going to have to take that collection come get me out. <laughs> okay. And you have to get both of us out, so you have to, you have to give help. <laughs> but Christians shall be persecuted was one of the things that Jesus said. One of the other things that he said that really hurts. And it hurts because of just having the thought. And that thought is that some of the people that will turn the Christians in are people who said that they are Christians. Will be people that claim that they are still Christians. You cannot turn your brother in knowing that your brother or your sister is going to jail and be persecuted for what they did and call yourself a Christian. You can't do that. That's, that's not possible. But Jesus Christ said that it would happen. And he went on to say in uh, Mark 13, 13, that's one of the Verses I can always remember. Mark 13, 13. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he shall, that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Notice several things there. Number one, you shall be hated of all men. Because we are Christians, that is the reason we're going to be hated. Not because we've got blue eyes, not because we've got black skin, not because we're tall, not because we're short, not because we're fat, not because we're ugly, but because we hold on to the name of Jesus Christ. We are going to be hated of all men. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. 
And that brings us up to two other serious things that are going to happen. He said that Jerusalem would be compassed about with armies. This is absolutely and positively stated without any reservation whatsoever. Jesus said that Jerusalem would be absolutely 100% surrounded by foreign armies. That did happen in 70 AD. Jesus also said that there would be someone come in and desecrate the holy place of the temple. Again, that happened in the year 70 AD. The man's name was Titus. He was a general. Titus came first. He sieged the entire city of Jerusalem. They kept trying to get in and break down that piece of the wall. If they could break one piece of the wall, they could enter in. And uh, history says they broke down part of the north wall on the other side of the temple area. And they came into the city and they literally sacked the city. They arrested everyone they could arrest. The only people they didn't bother with were the old people that couldn't get up and argue with them. And some of the infants, they didn't didn't take them. But if the child was two, three, or four years old, or if it was a, an able-bodied adult, they were taken, they were taken as slaves, they went back to Rome. Some of them, of course, were sold on the way there, but some of them went back to Rome, some of them were sold out, and uh, history books tell us that some of them were sold out to other countries. They went as far as France, they went to England, they went to Germany, they went up into Norway, Sweden, and so forth. And if you look back at the history of the Jews being dispersed, we find pockets of Jews in England, in Ireland, in Scotland, in Germany, uh, Poland, uh, Norway, Sweden. All of those areas have pockets of Jews. And the, the way they became there, the, the pockets of Jews, were populated by the slaves that were sold up in there. Some of the slaves got away uh, sometimes. You know, some, some years later, slavery was uh, gotten rid of for a lot of people. And, and this is one thing a lot of folks don't understand about slavery. There was a lot of folks who, <clears throat> like Bob and Barbara, might have had me and Lori as, as slaves. And once Bob and Barbara got up to the point that, you know, they're old, they don't really need slaves anymore, they just turned us loose. And maybe they had a little place, you know, down on the far side of their farm, yeah, you guys can be down there and live in that house. You're free. Go on. And we would be given a paper proving our freedom. <clears throat> a lot of the Jews got their freedom that way. But uh, <clears throat> Jesus said that uh, they would desecrate the holy place in the temple. Titus himself is recorded in history as having walked in not only to the holy place, but having walked into the most holy place. He wanted to see what was going on in there. One thing he did not get to see, and we do not know to this day. Uh, there probably are a few people who really do know, but they ain't saying nothing. And this is the Ark of the Covenant. When they broke into the temple, and they went, to the, they actually went one of the prizes that the soldiers were told, you, we will get the Ark of the Covenant. It is covered in solid gold. It has two angels on the top that are made out of solid gold. It has a lid that is covered in solid gold. We're going to melt the gold off and share it with you. Well, when they got into the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant was gone. Where is it today? I wish I knew, Brother Jim. <laughs> I, would, I would love to go and just look at it, walk out, and never tell anybody that I'd ever seen it. Just be able to say, yep, I saw it. Nobody knows where it is. They did not get it. But they did destroy the temple that Jesus walked in. And that brings us up to the next point. <clears throat> Jesus walked into a temple. Jesus taught in a temple. Jesus walked around the temple. The disciples did the same. And then later, we come to a book in the Bible. It's called the book of Revelation. And they start talking about a temple again. Wait a minute. If the temple is destroyed, how can you talk about a temple? Well, the only way you can talk about a temple is if another one is built. 
And today, in Israel, there is a lot of talk about rebuilding or building a temple. The uniforms, I guess I, I hate to use that word, that's, that's what it amounts to, though. The uniforms for the Levite priests have all been made. They, in fact, they've been made for a number of years now. Not only are the uniforms made, <clears throat> all of the tools, all of the utensils, everything is red. In fact, uh, back in the, I believe it was in the early 60s, the program, a breeding program was started in Israel because in order to open up the temple, they have to have holy water in order to anoint the building. In order to have holy water to anoint the building, you have to have the ashes of a red heifer. Israel went into a breeding program to get a red heifer. It took them about six or eight years, but they now have a line of red heifers. And when this one particular red heifer gets old enough that she should be a cow now, they breed her. And they breed her in such a way that her child will also become red. Now, if it's a male child, a little bull calf, though, it's gone away. But one of the other heifers that has been bred will produce a, another red heifer. They keep, they, they, they've got a bunch of them. They keep them there for the day when they are able to build the temple. And part of the discussion is to build the temple, not up on Temple Mount. If the Jews took a stone up there and somebody went up with a mortar trowel, the Muslims would jump up and down and scream, they're bringing up the stuff to build the temple. And there would be a war. But if the Jews went down over the hill, where a lot of people believe the old temple was, in the city of David, they can build their temple there. And if they build their temple there, the folks, we're going to be there. Uh, the time is coming. The last scripture there comes out of Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. And you might mark this down someplace. One of the singularly most important chapters in all of life for the end times is Revelation chapter 11. Revelation has 22 chapters. You cut the book of Revelation dead in half. Letters, you know, 11 or 12 through 22, 1 through 11. 1 through 11 is the chronological order of things that are going to happen at the end of the world. Just as simple as that. It's one, two, three, four, five, right on down, about the whole line. It's the chronological order. Chapters 12 through 22 are fill-in pieces. We've all watched the movie somewhere on television where up on the screen it says 1938. And the movie goes on and gets up almost to the end. And then they go back and they pick up something and they show you something that happened in 1940. Then they show you something that happened in 1942. And then something that happened in 1948. Something that happened in 1961. And then they bring you up to get to see the final end. That's the way the Bible, the book of Revelation, that's the way it's written. So when you get to chapter 11 in the book of Revelation, uh, Mark, when you get over to the end of chapter 11, take your little black marker and just write the end. Because that's where, that's what happens. In chapter 11, the seventh trumpet sounds. Jesus Christ comes back. It's all over and done with. But in chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, the angel came to John the Revelator and said, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. <clears throat> the temple that Jesus knew, the temple that he walked in, the temple that he uh, preached in, I guess that would be a good way to say it, was destroyed again by Titus in 70 AD. 
we're approaching this other thing that Jesus talked about, this other first thing, where Jerusalem is going to be surrounded by armies again. Right now, Lebanon would love nothing better than to come down and sweep through Israel, knocking everything aside they could. Next door to them is Syria. Syria. <laughs> yes, sir, just give me a chance. Egypt has signed a peace agreement, I guess is the right way to say it. I'm not sure it's a peace agreement. I think it's a non-aggressive agreement, one against the other. But Israel and Egypt have been having cooperative peace for a number of years. In fact, it's probably pretty close to 10 years now. <clears throat> Israel and Jordan have a begrudging peace. It's kind of like two big bullies, one on each side of the line, just waiting for the other, <laughs> waiting for the other one to make a move. Uh, Jordan has not done anything overt in a number of years. Uh, and part of that uh, has been because of the influence of the United States. Uh, today, the influence of the United States is really that and the fact that Israel has not been afraid to do what it had to do. But many of you may remember that a few years back, Israel sent some of its airplanes to a city called Baghdad, uh, to a company called Iraq. And when those, those planes flew less than 150 feet off the ground, now you think of 150 feet, that's not very far at all. That's the depth of Bob and Barbara's lot there they live maybe a little bit deeper than that, maybe what you got, 120 foot lot there, something like that. Less than 150 feet they flew over the ground at 600 miles an hour for hours on end to get there. They actually refueled in flight uh, in order to get there. Uh, but when they got there, <laughs> planes went up took a nose on their target, uh, dropped their bombs, and Iraq no longer had the ability to produce an atomic nuclear warhead because they had absolutely destroyed Iraq's nuclear capability. Israel is not afraid. That's the point I'm trying to make. Israel is not afraid to do what it has to do to stay alive, stay afloat, so to speak. But again, the influence in the United States is a big push to help them stay that way. The other thing that uh, is going to happen there is that one of these days, there is going to be a very serious, in fact, there's a serious discussion today. There's going to be a very serious push to create and to build the third temple. This occupation around Jerusalem will not come until that third temple is built. And the reason I say that is part of the reason for the occupation, if you look at the chronological order of steps, is because the temple was built. Once the rest of the Muslim world sees Israel back worshiping God and the way they're going to be doing that is every morning there will be a lamb sacrificed. Every evening there will be a lamb sacrificed. Uh, on the holy days there will be two in the morning, two in the evening. Uh, other times there will be two in the morning, two in the evening. They're going to be doing this. They're going to go all the way back to the old sacrifice way of worship. They're not doing that today. There are, I think I can honestly say, hundreds of thousands of Jews would love to be able to get up on a Sunday morning, the first day of the week, and walk down to the temple with their lamb that they bought at the market and say, sacrifice this lamb for my family for this week. Hundreds of thousands of people would love to be able to do that. And Israel is going to go back to that. The Bible is very plain on that. But once they do that, once they get the temple built, once they go back to sacrifice, we see that Israel uh, 
especially Jerusalem, is going to be surrounded by armies. Uh, once it's surrounded by armies, it's, they're going to be invaded. And uh, once they're invaded, the scripture says, uh, there in the last part, that the holy city, they shall tread under foot 40 and two months. That's three and a half years. That's where we read in the Bible and we understand that the real heavy part of the tribulation will start there. Because at that same time, there will also be, uh, I hate to use the term world ruler, uh, that's probably not the right way to say it, but he will have enough power that he is going to be able to stop the daily sacrifice. He's going to have enough authority that his second in command is going to be able to institute the mark of the beast. We've talked about the mark of the beast before. Uh, always remember, when people start talking about the mark of the beast, it is not a card in your billfold. It is not a thing on the chain, on your key ring. It will be something in the right hand, not the left, right hand, not the arm, not the elbow, not the shoulder, right hand, or in the forehead. It may be a mark that's visible, it probably won't be. And the reason I say it probably won't be, how many women, here today, how many of you women would like to have a tattoo on your forehead? Uh -huh. <laughs> I saw a bunch of kids say no. How many of you guys would like to have a tattoo on your forehead? Yeah, see? It's, it's a vain thing. People are not going to allow some tattoo on their forehead or some tattoo on their hand. It's going to be something that is basically going to be invisible. And today they have the technology with the little chip that goes under the skin. It's injected by a hypodermic needle. There's, they say there's almost no pain. They numb the hand with a rag or some solvent or whatever, and as soon, as soon as your hand gets numb, they slip the little chip in there. The chip does not have in itself a lot of knowledge. The chip in, it, in itself is nothing more than a chip to identify Jim Mills. World security number 1275932 USA. Jim Mills. When they read that with a reader, it goes back to the computer. It says that Jim Mills lives in Marysville. Um, he's married to Sandy. He's got a blue car. Uh, he's got so much payments left on the blue car. Uh, he has so much money in the bank. He does most of his grocery shopping at uh, Kroger's or wherever. They'll have more information on you and you can shake stick it. That's what the mark of the beast will be. And without that mark, without being able to walk into Myers, Kroger's, or whatever, walk in, there'll be someone standing there with a wand. If you do not have that in your hand, you, out. You're not allowed to shop. You're not allowed to get groceries. You, it doesn't say that specifically. It says that if you don't take the mark of the beast, you will not be able to buy or sell. I believe that might also mean you can't sell your ability to work. You can't sell your labors to your employer anymore. It's very probable. It's not specifically stated, but it's very probable that when you go in to your employer, you will also be checked. If you don't have the chip, you did not get to go to work. But even if you did get to go to work, and even if you did get paid, they will not allow you to have the ability to buy your groceries. You can't pay your rent. Uh, it will be a cashless society. Most people firmly believe that uh, dollar bills and dollar coins and gold bars and so forth will be worthless. It will only be electronic cash that's allowed to be used. And of course, Without the chip, you can't use the electronic cash. Without the chip, your boss can't pay you uh, in your electronic banking account. So it's going to be pretty tough for the Christians. But again, the scripture says there that the occupying force uh, will be there for three and a half years. Uh, in that three and a half years, uh, the occupying leader will stop the daily sacrifice. Um, once the daily sacrifice gets stopped, um, 
we honestly believe this is where Revelation chapter 11, the two prophets, the two final prophets come up. And they begin to they begin to preach against this world leader or whatever word you want to use, this emperor, uh, this king, I don't know what, what word you want to call him. But they're going to preach against this guy. And this guy is going to hate him for all there is. And he's going to do everything he can for three and a half years. Scripture is pretty plain on that. 1260 days, three and a half years. He's going to do everything he can to put them down. Uh, and I, I don't mean to sound political, but they're going to, he's going to do to them as the Democrats did to President Trump for three and a half years. Everything they could to destroy his uh, work and so forth. This man is going to do everything he can to destroy the work of these two prophets. And eventually he's going to get these two prophets in such a place that he kills them. When he kills them, they're going to lay in the street for three and a half days. They're going to lay in the street of Jerusalem. And I, the first time I ever thought about this, I almost kind of laughed in one, one respect, kind of laughed in the other respect, I wanted to cry. If you've ever seen, and I hope none of you have, but if you've ever seen a dead body that has been out in the outside, out in the forces of nature, especially in the sun, for a length of time, the human body stinks worse than anything I have ever smelled in my life. It is a, it is a, an aroma that once you get a smell of it, you'll never forget it. But the human body also floats up like that possum or that coon that you saw out in the middle of the road one day that was all brown and floated up. The human body is going to be the same way. In three and a half days, uh, those two guys are going to be, <laughs> they're going to be fatter than ever was before. But then, Brother Jim, <laughs> the voice of Almighty God going to say, come up hither, and those bloated bodies are going to shrink back down, and I thought, the first time I thought about this, because the Bible says the world's going to see this, there'll be cameras, and uh, news people, channel 4, channel 6, and channel 10, all that, all that people are going to be there, they're going to have their cameras, and I can see this one young fellow, he's looking in the thing there, and he's sitting on his chair, He's got both handles, and he's got it all in. him. He's watching this one body, and all of a sudden, that finger moves. And he's watching those black, bloated bodies, and they start shrinking down, and they start turning pink. And he gets off of that seat that he was, the next thing you see is he's going out of there. <laughs> I had to laugh when I thought about that. You see, these are the things that God has promised that are going to happen. Where are we today? Well, today, there is no temple. Today, Jerusalem is peaceful, or at least not at war. Maybe not peaceful, but not at war. But at the same time, there are some things that are on the horizon. Uh, number one, pray for our country mistakes or decisions that are being made. The new occupant in the White House a couple days ago signed an agreement with the Palestinians. He's going to provide them, and it depends on who you listen to, something between 4 and $11 billion this year. It's supposed to be for aid. President Trump when he was in office, shut down most of that aid. And the reason he shut down most of that aid was because most of that aid was going to Russia, and the reason it was going to Russia was to buy bullets, it was to buy guns, it was to buy helmets, it was to buy uniforms. It was not aid that was helping the people. It was aid that was getting ready to allow the Palestinians to come to Israel. The latest occupant of the White House has promised Again, depending on who you listen to, somewhere between four and eleven billion dollars this year to the Palestinians. It's time to pray for Israel. 
such as we had never done before. And part of the reason that I tell you you really need to pray for Israel is you open the Bible up and you say, well, you know, the United States really loves Israel. And the United States has helped Israel since 1948. The United States will help Israel when this happens. And then you start looking for it. When you get done, we're not there. There is absolutely no mention of any outside force anywhere that helps Israel other than Almighty God. The United States has a lot of names. Almighty God ain't one of them. So while you're praying for Israel, pray for our nation. You've heard me say many times that flag is the most important flag that will ever be in my life. But about two steps behind it comes that. That's the one I spent 18 years of my life doing the best I could to defend. Bob has spent a number of years, Jim has spent a number of years defending that flag so that we could defend this flag. If you can't defend that one, you won't get a chance to defend this one. Pray for our country. Pray for our leaders. We're at a point not too long from now, it could be the point of no return. And with that, we close the message for today. Let's all stand. Sandy should be here to sing Big 81. Since she's not, I'm not going to try to sing it by myself. What I'm going to say is, if there's anyone here today that has a prayer request or needs prayer, um, just make your way up here. I'll put my mask on. We'll pray. Anyone at all this morning? All right. If all hearts and minds are clear, while you're standing on your feet, would you give your attention for the blessing? May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Brother Gary, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to come together, Father, and learn about your word. Father, we thank you for this little church. We just pray that we have done everything you'd have us do here today. And we pray that you give us traveling mercies as we travel home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, my God.